momento con ustedes y con los expositores que vamos a tener en la mañana de hoy ¿no? sobre para eh, divulgar los conocimientos que tenemos en, en dos aspectos importantes. ¿no? Uno es el, eh, los conocimientos de la sismicidad en el Ecuador como un preámbulo ¿no? para la charla, eh, que la, eh, la charla de sobre la sismicidad en el, en el Ecuador la va a dictar el doctor Hugo Yepes, ¿no? compañero nuestro, y el, eh, que será como un preámbulo para la, la charla del doctor Hiroyuki Kumagai, ¿no? quien hablará sobre el método eh, SWIFT, ¿no? que es eh, el análisis de, las, de la fuente sísmica con el método SWIFT y su uso para el monitoreo de los sismos. ¿no? Estos dos, eh, estas charlas se enmarcan dentro de las actividades del proyecto que lleva el Instituto Geofísico para el mejoramiento de las capacidades para la, eh, el estudio de los terremotos y la de los terremotos que pudieran, de los terremotos tsunamigénicos, los terremotos que se pueden, que pueden generar tsunamis, ¿no? y que hemos visto ¿no? que son los terremotos con, ma con mayor cantidad de energía que pueden ocurrir y que han ocurrido frente a nuestras, a nuestras costas. ¿no? Creemos que estas charlas son muy importantes para nosotros. ¿no? Creemos que el, los conocimientos que se van a brindar aquí son son eh, igualmente muy importantes, no es por esto que les hemos pedido su asistencia ¿no? y que con la seguridad de que, los, eh, de que lo que escuchemos aquí será provechoso para, no, para nuestro, nuestra preparación y para el trabajo y para entender mejor el trabajo que estamos, eh, que estamos haciendo. ¿no? Entonces eh, les, eh, les voy a dejar con ustedes a los expositores ¿no? y eh, le reciban de manera general, la bienvenida de parte del Instituto Geofísico. Buenos días con todas y con todos. La charla mía será breve y tratará de poner algunas ideas generales sobre la sismicidad en el Ecuador. Como todos sabemos, el, el Ecuador está básicamente eh, enmarcado en dos uh, placas tectónicas activas, como todos conocemos, la placa de Nazca eh, moviéndose a una velocidad a esta latitud uh, donde está la flecha de 56 milímetros por año y un segundo borde de, de placa, de una micro placa que es el bloque norandino que tiene un movimiento de alrededor de 9 milímetros por año en sentido nor eh, noreste. Pero uh, esto, obviamente, la presencia de dos placas a esta velocidad da uh, uh, en el Ecuador un alto potencial sísmico que además está eh, incrementado por la deformación uh, activa a nivel de la corteza que se puede ver muy bien en el Ecuador en el crecimiento andino, pero también en la sismicidad que está relacionada con la deformación interna del bloque norandino, sobre todo a nivel de las vertientes eh, orientales de la cordillera occidental, es decir, el lado que no, en que nosotros vemos eh, del bloque, eh, que nosotros vemos desde el eh, la depresión interandina hacia la cordillera occidental. Si es que vemos uh, la, sismicidad, la sismicidad instrumental, el Ecuador tiene una historia muy larga de terremotos muy fuertes. Es muy bien conocido el terremoto de 1906 de magnitud 8.8, que es uno de los 10 más eh, energéticos, que más energía sísmica liberada en la historia instrumental del mundo. Uh, pero también se tienen, si es que este es el uh, límite de 7.5 uh, MW de magnitud, se tienen los sismos de 1942, 53, 58 y 79, el color rojo indica que todos estos son sismos de la interfase. Uh, si es que vemos a, a nivel de 7 para arriba, vemos que no solo son estos de, siete, de, de esta magnitud, sino que una serie de sismos de la interfase que más o menos dan una recurrencia para sismos de 7 en la, los últimos 100, 
eh, 15 años de, de la sismicidad en Ecuador, una recurrencia de alrededor de 6.5 sismos de esta magnitud por, uh, eh, por década. Uh, perdón, eh, dan una, una recurrencia de, de 6.5 años. Eh, y, pero además vemos eh, que aparecen, empiezan a aparecer los sismos corticales que eh, son eh, eh, básicamente de otras características, pues son eh, superficiales, eh, están relacionados en gran parte al bloque norandino y esos son los más fuertes, pero también eh, hay eh, estos sismos que son moderados a lo largo de, el, eh, como decía, el borde occidental de la cordillera. Uh, eh, de, de la depresión interandina. Ahora bien, si vemos la sismicidad histórica en el Ecuador, es decir, estábamos viendo la sismicidad instrumental acá, si es que vemos la sismicidad eh, que ha sido posible definirla en base a la historia uh, escrita del Ecuador, eh, vemos que eh, si es que tenemos esto, esta escala de intensidades, Podemos dividir al, al país en aquellos eh, efectos sobre la, la, la zona andina, la zona costera y la zona de la, de la cuenca alta amazónica, en donde claramente eh, se ve que eh, en primer lugar el siglo XX eh, presenta, eh, o en primer lugar que las intensidades mayores están fundamentalmente relacionadas a la zona andina, intensidades menores están relacionadas a la costa cuando en realidad las máximas eh, las máximas de energías están liberadas acá a nivel de la de la, uh, de la costa y de la uh, están, están uh, básicamente a nivel de la subducción y menores de energía de acá, pero son los sismos eh, eh, corticales los que a su vez, este es el número de víctimas, genera el mayor número de víctimas. Y a su vez, vemos también que en el siglo XX eh, se tiene, eh, eh, o básicamente hay un gran terremoto por siglo eh, eh, encontrado en la historia, siendo el eh, terremoto mayor, el de eh, 1797, en donde se destruyen, como ustedes podrán ver, con intensidades de 8 desde la Tacunga hasta eh, a la UCI y hacia el oeste está Guaranda uh, y Chimbo, um, el que, de los terremotos que más uh, impacto ocasionan. En cambio, en aquellas ciudades costeras que están más cerca de la zona de subducción, la máxima intensidad reportada es de 1942 en Bahía de Caracas y las demás intensidades son del orden de, de 8, eh, siendo esta intensidad de 9. ¿no? Entonces, eh, estos eh, terremotos de la interfase eh, básicamente están descritos además, ¿no? Eh, perdón, no les había dicho la... Este color está relacionado a los de la interfase, el primero que se describe en 1896, está en el siglo XX y eh, el número de, de, de víctimas es menor. ¿no? Eh, en cambio, en estos corticales son en realidad devastadores para las ciudades andinas y el número de víctimas está del orden de los 60.000. Ahora, de todos estos sismos de la, de la interfase, tenemos que tres generan tsunamis, que son el de 1906, 1958 y 1979, mientras que el de máxima intensidad, 1942, no tiene un, un tsunami reportado. Um, al ver la sismicidad, entonces, la distribución de la sismicidad en el país, vemos que eh, esto está basado en la depuración del catálogo eh, o la generación del catálogo con efectos de cálculo del peligro sísmico en donde está la sismicidad instrumental a nivel mundial eh, eh, resumida en el catálogo más lento de la sismicidad que nosotros hemos eh, empezado a generar desde el 1990 eh, los colores son más eh, calientes, son más superficiales y más oscuros, más fríos son 
más profundos. Vemos claramente que se dibuja la subducción acá, pero también se nota que al sur del país la sismicidad más profunda es eh, más importante. El catálogo tiene eh, básicamente cerca de 11.000 eventos eh, con unas magnitudes de, de 3 a 8.8, mientras que los sismos instrumentales que veíamos desde las intensidades son 31 eventos importantes con magnitudes de 5 a, a 7.6. Si es que separamos el catálogo en, unas, en aquellos sismos que tienen una profundidad menor que 50 kilómetros con los más profundos y donde vemos que estos puntitos muy pequeños son magnitud 5 y esto magnitud eh, menor que 7 eh, que está relacionado a la... Y el círculo es proporcional al momento liberado eh, y aquí está la escala de, de profundidades entonces vemos claramente que la zona de subducción tiene los sismos uh, más importantes, ya los, ya los vimos, um, eh, incluyendo entonces el, el de Loja de 1970, este es el conocido como el sismo de, de, de Machala, del Oro, eh, 1953, y los sismos de Bahía 1958, el 42, Esmeralda 58, Tumaco del 79 y el Grande de 1906. Pero... Si es que nos vamos de acá, estos triángulos rojos son el, los volcanes, vemos que al sur están eh, básicamente concentrados en una franja los sismos mayores de magnitud mayor que 7 y a unas profundidades específicas de 130 kilómetros. De tal manera que hay una muy interesante distribución de la sismicidad que eh, está condicionada por, eh, si es que vemos la sismicidad, profunda que está condicionada fundamentalmente por el hecho de que en el ecuador se, se, en el ecuador está subduciéndose la placa de nazca que en realidad son dos placas diferentes totalmente diferentes esta es la placa de farallón antigua previa a la apertura de la nazca mientras que esta es la, la, placa, uh, la placa nueva de Nazca, en donde se nota claramente que eh, hay un incremento de la, de la edad de la placa uh, Farallón en ese sentido, pero a lo largo de esta línea, que es esta línea que eh, divide la sismicidad o separa la sismicidad profunda al sur y el norte del Ecuador, que es la, la, eh, la, eh, la sutura o la zona de apertura de la de, de rotura más bien de la placa de Farallón que se llama la, eh, el Rift eh, de Grijalva eh, esta, esta parte sur entonces eh, o más bien dicho esta parte norte en realidad es una placa, de, eh, una placa en la cual la edad disminuye en este sentido mientras que aquí la edad aumenta en este sentido estas dos placas claramente eh, muestran que las eh, demuestran más bien dicho que la influencia de la sismicidad a nivel prof de profundo en el Ecuador está relacionado a cuáles son las placas que se van subduciendo. En cambio, eh, si es que nos vamos a ver eh, la sismicidad superficial y lo que nos interesa que es la zona de la sismicidad eh, interfase. Eh, que tiene la, la mayor cantidad de, de, de uh, energía liberada y es la, la, los uh, sismos que generan tsunamis son precisamente esos grandes sismos de la interfase eh, vemos en cambio aquí que estos sismos como podemos ver están relacionados a la eh, cordillera sísmica de Carnegie que está subduciendo acá y que a su vez también al sur de Grijalva al sur de Grijalva no hay eh, eh, a excepción de estos dos eh, que son eh, que necesitan que están en esta zona de apertura del Golfo hacia el sur no hay sismicidad pero tampoco hay el acoplamiento que se nota claramente desde eh, la zona de la isla de la Plata y un poco eh, frente a Salinas hacia el norte y hacia el sur pero también se nota que al norte de o más o menos en la mitad de de Carnegie es en donde se generan los terremotos grandes como el de 1906 
y el de 1942 acá, uh, acá, mientras que aquí se tiene una, uh, como veremos acá, uh, como vemos acá, una asperidad relacionada con la, con la isla de la Plata. Esta es la modelación de las asperidades que se encuentran en la, en la zona y vemos que uh, acá, eh, no, perdón. Vemos que acá, entonces, estas asperidades están relacionadas a estos terremotos históricos, mientras que el gran terremoto eh, de 1906 ha, eh, eh, ha roto eh, toda, la, toda la zona de, de frente a la, digamos, toda la zona desde Carnegie para el norte, incluyendo varias asperidades en lo que se ha podido entonces llamar una, un superciclo de liberación de energía que eventualmente, según eh, Clie, eh, dura eh, o se repite cada 600 años, mientras que estos son eh, asperidades que se van rompiendo eh, del orden de los menos de, una, de, de un siglo de recurrencia o, o alrededor de un siglo por recurrencia. Todas estas se han roto y esta es una asperidad que está, eh, eh, que está eh, concluyéndose todavía. Uh, pero... Entonces, si es, que, si es que vemos dónde se han roto los terremotos, de esto es el 42, el 79, todo esto en 1906, y esto es Bahía en 1998, vemos también que entonces eh, esta zona eh, podría estar eh, acumulando energía, mientras que desde Grijalva hacia el sur no existe acumulación evidente de, eh, de formación, puesto que aparentemente no existe acoplamiento sísmico según esta escala. Sin embargo, eh, en la resolución que tiene estos métodos de la, de la deformación sísmica no nos debe llevar a decir que aquí no hay peligro sísmico, sino que esta zona de peligro sísmico de los grandes tsunamis puede ser también, eh, de, 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 de los grandes terremotos, puede ser también generadora de tsunamis. ¿no? Entonces, en conclusión vemos que eh, Carnegie ha funcionado como una barrera para la ruptura de los grandes terremotos que vienen desde el norte o que se desplazan hacia el norte. El acoplamiento muestra esta serie de asperidades que pueden fallar en diferentes combinaciones, lo cual implica o quiere decir que eh, puede romperse esta con esta o esta con esta, etc. y generar magnitudes diferentes. La discontinuidad de Grijalva es seguramente una barrera para eventuales terremotos mayores que va a ser muy difícil que superen esta barrera y rompan hacia el sur con lo cual la magnitud de los terremotos al norte eh, puede estar limitada pero es una no. recurrencia o un, eh, muy muy larga pero de, de ninguna manera despreciable uh, finalmente uh, este mismo acoplamiento acá es el responsable de la, del movimiento del bloque norandino y esta es la eh, deformación que genera los terremotos que ya vimos que son en realidad los terremotos que producen las grandes víctimas y el gran daño eh, históricamente en el Ecuador eh, en conclusión el peligro sísmico del Ecuador es muy grande hay, uh, hay eh, lastimosamente a nivel nacional una falta de eh, de, de percepción del riesgo y una falta de apropiación de eh, eh, este, este riesgo sísmico que tenemos y eh, es eh, importante que el, eh, este conocimiento de la, del peligro sísmico, de la potencialidad sísmica, de la potencialidad de tsunami sea eh, transmitido, sea pasado a la sociedad para que no nos encuentre como ahora en el caso del Cortopaxi tratando de aprender a bailar en medio del baile. ¿no? Uh, muchas gracias. Uh, buenos días. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, today I'm going to talk about more specific uh, topic about the swift uh, source analysis. And it's used for uh, earthquake monitoring. And uh, I'm focusing on uh, more technical aspects on uh, SIFT, as well as uh, our recent progress uh, in uh, earthquake monitoring using SWIFT. So this is my, the outline of my talk. The, I still start with the 
earthquake source representation. And then I explained uh, the concept of a waveform inversion. And then I explain more details about the sweep source analysis method. And then finally, I will show some uh, our uh, results of the earthquake monitoring in uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, using SWIFT, as well as our progress in Ecuador. <coughs> okay, then to understand the earthquake source process, uh, I start with the equation of motion. Okay, <coughs> this uh, is the equation of motion for continuum medium. The UI is a displacement, and the rho is a density, and then sigma IN is a stress, and then FI is an external force. And this is a very general equation for the continuum medium uh, equation of motion. And then if we consider the earthquake source, then this equation can be finally uh, given to this equation. And uh, this is a very general equation for uh, earthquake source uh, representation. And uh, UI is a displacement. So the displacement field is explained by this equation, where Fj is a single force, and the Gij is the Green's function, and Mjk is the moment tensor, and uh, this is Green's function's uh, spatial derivative. And then I will explain detail about the single force and the moment tensor later. And uh, if you look at this equation, this is a convolution in time. Okay, so that when we use a Fourier transform, then this equation can be more simplified uh, into, you know, uh, we know that uh, this convolution becoming a multiplication in a frequency domain. So that uh, it's more a simple equation that uh, in a frequency domain displacement field is a single force and Green's function multiplication, and then moment tensor and the Green's function spatial derivative. So that this is uh, our basic equation for our representation of earthquake source. And then I explained that uh, that we use a moment tensor and a single force for the earthquake source representation, and the moment tensor consists of uh, nine components, and the single force consists of the three components. And then, if we do not consider rotational motion at the source, then the independent uh, components become six in moment tensor, given in a red. So that uh, to represent the earthquake source, source, in general speaking, we need uh, six moment tensor components and three single force components. Okay. <coughs> then, the moment tensor uh, in uh, each component is given by the couple of two forces. For example, M11 is a couple of two forces in a different direction. And uh, the M1 to M13 is a more uh, 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 forces in a, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I forgot the name, but it's a, <coughs> anyway, the couple of forces. And then, anyway, single force is the, the anyway, single force in uh, three. Uh, uh, coordinate directions. And then we will see that this moment tensor is very useful to represent a faulting uh, source, I mean faulting motion, as uh, we know that that is occurring at the uh, earthquake source. <coughs> so that let's consider such a uh, source mechanism in a very simple case, starting with a simple case. Okay, we consider uh, some plane defined by sigma, and uh, across this plane, we have a displacement. Uh, in upper part, we have a uh, this direction, and the lower part we have this direction. So that it's kind of a faulting motion. So that we say this is the displacement discontinuity. So that there is a faulting motion across this plane. Okay, and then we show that such this uh, displacement discontinuity using the bracket U. Okay. Then this. Okay. Then let's look at this uh, source in uh, this direction in a uh, uh, one and gusai three. Uh, oops. 
So. Okay, then the, we, we're looking at the, the such plane in, in this direction so that there is a sigma here, and we have a you know, faulting motion on this plane, across this plane. And such motion is theoretically proved that this is equivalent to the force system called double couple. So that to that such slip motion is equivalent represented by the two uh, couples forces that is called double couple. So that this force system is equivalent to this whole motion. So then when we look at, we, we decompose this force system, then uh, this fo uh, force di and plus this force, then we have this tensional force. And uh, using those two, then we have compressional motion uh, force, so that we say this is a tension motion. And then such double couple forces can be equivalently represented the moment tensor, so that such two couples is combination of M31 and M13. Okay, this, if you combine those two uh, components, then we can have this double couple. Okay, <coughs> then, so that this double couple force system can be given by moment tensor with this equation, 0, 0, M13, 0, 0, 0, and M3100. And uh, those value has the same uh, amplitude so that we can rewritten in this form. And uh, this M0 is called moment. Okay. <coughs> and then we use the some uh, uh, representation for uh, source mechanism using that beach ball representation. So that uh, we use that this sphere and uh, we use a red uh, uh, some color region in a T axis and then white in a P axis so that uh, this can be used for the representation of a source. So when we look at this uh, representation from the top, from viewing from top and uh, using a lower sphere projection, then this is seen as this uh, red and white. Okay, then if we rotate this system into 40, 45 degree in this direction, then this becomes normal faulting. So that uh, in this case, in a beach ball, here it becomes white. Okay, and then we rotate in the opposite direction, then this becoming a reverse faulting, and so that this becoming red in top portion. So that in this way, we can represent the source mechanism in this beach ball diagram, okay? Yeah, from the top, being from top, okay? And then, it's very specific uh, faulting geometries, but for a more general case, the fault can be described three angles. The, when we define the fault, then this fault geometry can be defined by strike from the north and deep and rake angle that define the slip direction. Okay, and the using, using those three parameters, then moment tensor can be given by this equation. <coughs> so that as you see that the three angles are given in this moment tensor component. And then uh, we have also M0 here. And uh, this, in a matrix form, we can uh, give in this equation so that uh, to describe such fault, we need the uh, three angles as well as M0 moment, okay? <coughs> and then when we consider the fault growth, I mean, fault start at the hypocenter, 
and then it evolves in time and it grows. So that when we consider this uh, simple case, okay, then as time goes, this fault becomes more and more larger, and the displacement discontinuity becomes more larger. And then, so that here we have moment, but this moment is a function of time. So then this moment is given by this equation so that uh, uh, mu is a rigidity of the medium and the displaced discontinuity in a surface, uh, the integral along this uh, plane. So that in this sense, the moment evolves in time so that, that uh, earthquake faulting motion starts, then this like a step function. And then this size defines the size of the earthquake. And then when we make some time derivative of the moment function, this then becomes more uh, pulse-like function. Okay, so that this level is used to, uh, to represent the size of source earthquake, and uh, that is called seismic moment. Okay, and then the, it, this seismic moment is given by mu SD, mu is the rigidity of the medium, and S is a fault area, and D is average slip or displacement. And so that this is a physical expression of the size of the earthquake, and then the magnitude, moment magnitude, is defined by using this moment with this equation. Then I also mentioned that the moment tensor can be also used to represent uh, sources with a volumetric change. For example, some source with a spherical expansion or some pipe or crack expansion, then uh, moment tensor can be used to represent such uh, sources. And especially those diagonal components, and this define the volume change. And then in case of sphere, that this ratio becomes one, 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 and a pipe, vertical pipe, two, two, one, and a but vertical crack, three, one, one. Okay. Then, so that we need to estimate moment tensor to quantitatively represent the earthquake source, then to do so, we use a waveform inversion. Okay, so we assume source in a moment tensor for faulting motion, faulting source. And uh, we have to calculate, we have to have Green's function, but this we, s we do this in a numerical way, assuming velocity and density structure. And then we solve inverse problem uh, for a waveform match between observed and synthetic seismographs. And in this way, we estimate moment tensor at the source. And that is a general comp concept of the, for the waveform inversion. And then I explain in a, in a with the equations. So that uh, this is uh, the first equation I explained, but with that single force. So then this is, uh, can be used for the earthquake faulting source. And then <coughs> in a frequency domain, this is equivalently given by this equation. And so then we assume six moment tensor components, then this equation can be equivalently given by this form. So assuming six so that we have six unknown for, for uh, moment tensor components. And then this also uh, written in a ma matrix form in this way. And uh, this defines a synthetic seismograms equation. And so we solve, I mean, that we have difference between observed seismograms and a synthetic seismograms. And we say this is error or misfit. And then we minimize the, those misfit. And uh, because we are uh, uh, using the frequency domain so that uh, this uh, becomes a, a niche and conjugate, but uh, in a, it's uh, equivalent to the transpose in a time domain. Yeah. Uh, so that we minimize this uh, misfit, 
And then this is very known program in the least squares program, so that uh, this program can be solved using the normal equation, and uh, that is given by this equation. And uh, this is called the least squares solution, solution in frequency domain. And then when we use the uh, inverse Fourier transform, then we can have uh, least square solution in time domain in this way. Okay, then this is very general concept for the waveform inversion. But then we have uh, some uh, choice for the basis of the moment tensor components. I explained in a very general case that uh, we use a uh, six moment tensor components. But uh, usually, for example, Kikuchi Kanamori proposed that to use the uh, five basis for the moment tensor components. And then they propose to use those five components. And uh, this is very good for repre good to represent the earthquake source because when we use this five basis, then this is a pure deviatric or non-volumetric moment tensor. So that in a earthquake faulting motion, we don't expect the volume change. So that uh, this is a very good assumption or constraint uh, for the earthquake source. But the problem with this is that, uh, as I explained, that the uh, faulting motion is equivalent to double couple, okay? But this basis, okay, can represent double couple, but also include non-double couple <coughs> component. And uh, that is called compensated linear vector dipole. CLVD. And then this is no volumetric component, but it's not double coupled. For example, when we consider this combination, okay, a vertical pipe contraction associated with a horizontal crack inflation. And uh, this, okay, so that we add those two different volume changes, then moment tensor become this because zero, minus one, and one. And then when you look at here, this is trace becomes zero, so that it's no, no volumetric change. But, okay, so that then this is also given by M2 and M5 in a previous, this basis. This plus this becomes this equation. Okay. So then this is okay, using such a uh, five basis, yeah, it's good to have a known volumetric component uh, constraint, but as you see here, this is not purely representing the double couple source. So that uh, this includes some uh, non double couple component. But uh, this is very problematic. So such CLVD component it really exists, or it's a, some spurious or just artifact based on our uh, assumption of the basis. And also another problem is that uh, the trade-off between the source location and this CLBD component uh, occurs. So then in, in, in view of the analysis, such non-volumetric component is very, very problematic. And so, Pure double couple component uh, te moment tensor is given by this equation as I explained. So that to, to purely, to assume purely double couple or to purely faulting motion, we should use this equation, okay? So in a Swift, we use this equation so that we purely assume faulting motion. And then we also assume a point source. And then this is a uh, very good point uh, because uh, such strong constraint, I mean, more, uh, more strong assumption about earthquake source, then inversion solution are stabilized when using the data from small number of stations. And also we perform uh, grid search in space to find the best fitting location. And then in this, uh, 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 for this, we use uh, some grid 
spacing uh, reduced gradually so that we use uh, uh, different uh, steps for uh, and using uh, more uh, different grid sizes. So that uh, in this way we can, this uh, process uh, makes us uh, efficient switch for a broader area to find the best fitting source location. And uh, this is what uh, SWIFT is doing. And then, so that uh, this is our uh, schematic view for the SWIFT method. So that we perform grid switch in space in uh, a longitude latitude depth. So and then each node, we perform grid switch in uh, three fold angles. And then for each uh, 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 combination of uh, angles, we estimate the moment function by solving the waveform inversion. And then we solve this in the frequency domain. And I don't explain so much details about this, but uh, when we perform waveform inversion in frequency domain, it's much faster than doing in uh, time domain. So that we can have more uh, a quick, we can have quick solution uh, in this way. So <coughs> then SWIFT method has some features that uh, stable solution using data from a small number of stations and uh, fast computation. And also we estimate moment function or rapture duration uh, simultaneously. And that uh, this uh, process can be easily automated. Then look, look, let's look at our results using the SWIFT. The first example is from uh, 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 off Java 2006 earthquake. And uh, these earth earthquakes produced large tsunamis and uh, that uh, uh, devastated the coastal region of the Java island. And uh, more than 600 people are killed by this tsunami. And then um, we used uh, three component seismograms at uh, three stations uh, shown by red circles. Uh, then this is the grid switch result in, with SWIFT. And then the, our best fit location was determined at this position. And then this is our estimated uh, source mechanism. Okay? <coughs> and the depth was the 10 kilometer. And uh, those Two are USGS and the global CMT solutions. And then the location also given by the uh, yellow diamond. And our location is between those uh, 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 solutions. And uh, as you see that uh, we have uh, very similar features. And that is a uh, 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 thrusting motion, thrusting mechanism. And uh, as you see that the uh, USGS and the uh, global CMT uses the five basis waveform inversion procedure so that uh, they have, you can see some known uh, double couple components, but uh, we use a pure double couple component so that uh, we can estimate such uh, this uh, source mechanism with a very small number of stations. <coughs> and uh, this is our waveform fits. Uh, they, uh, we use the uh, in a period band 50 to 100 seconds, and uh, the uh, uh, waveform fits are probably good. <coughs> okay, and then we reconstruct the moment function. Okay, then because we use the bandpass filter between 50 and 100 seconds, so that the estimated source time function is a bandpass form, as shown in a in a red. So this uh, function, then we have this blue one, so that we fit to such a uh, bandwidth form to obtain the decomposed from the moment function. And uh, as you see that uh, this rapture continues more than 150 seconds. And uh, usually, and uh, this magnitude was estimated at 7.5. And as this size of earthquake rapture duration is about normally 10 to 20 seconds, but it's a, a normally long duration so that uh, this causes them as some slow sleep occurred at the uh, source region. And uh, that was uh, some uh, uh, cause of the large tsunamis for this size of the earthquake. And a similar one occurred in Mentawai, near the Mentawai Island, 2010. And then this was magnitude 6.7.6. Uh, but our, you know, safe analysis 
indicate that the rapture duration is more than 100 seconds. And this earthquake also produced large tsunamis. So in this sense, uh, SIFT is useful to identify tsunami earthquakes based on our reconstructed moment function. OK, then we move on to the case, uh, the, our big event in Japan in 2011, Tohoku Oki earthquake. And then this, this shows the intensity map based on uh, JMA, Japan Meteorological Agency intensity scale. And we, you see that uh, more than six plus in the Tohoku region. And uh, this is uh, equivalent to America intensity 10 to 11, so that it's uh, the maximum intensity. And then the, the shaking big, large. And also we had uh, large tsunamis. And uh, we had uh, serious damage in a, in a coastal region of the Tohoku region. And uh, we had uh, more than uh, 10, more than 10,000 people dead and missing. <coughs> and then at this uh, event occurrence, the Japan JMA failed uh, to estimate the correct uh, magnitude. <coughs> uh, the first JMA issued magnitude of 7.9 uh, three minutes after the event occurrence. And then <coughs> they tried to estimate moment magnitude using the waveform inversion approach. But uh, because of big shaking, the records from the broadband seismometers are all saturated in Japan. So that they couldn't perform waveform inversion to estimate moment magnitude. OK, then. They finally obtained the moment magnitude of 8.8 .8 using data at overseas stations. It took 50 minutes after the event occurrence. And then finally, they issued this moment magnitude two hours and 44 minutes after the event occurrence. And so that this underestimation of uh, magnitude at the, at the very early stage, and this also contributed to the underestimation of uh, tsunami height. And uh, this, this is a part of the cause of the, some of our uh, victims, because uh, some people thought that uh, the, the tsunami should be not so high, so that they don't need to escape, they thought. So that uh, in this sense, it's very essential to have a quick and correct magnitude for the prediction of tsunami height. <coughs> And then why did JMA fail to estimate the correct magnitude? OK. The JMA uses the, their over magnitude scale. And uh, that is based on uh, in a short period data in a previous time. So that uh, their magnitude is saturated around magnitude 8. So that they knew that this saturation occurs so that uh, they try to use the broadband records for their waveform inversion to estimate the moment magnitude. But that uh, they failed. And also, they didn't use seismic data from global seismic networks. Because uh, saturation occurred in uh, the records in Japan, but the more distant global network is not saturated. So that uh, if they used those data, then they could have more or better magnitude estimation. And also, for the broadband records, they used the normal broadband seismometer record, but uh, they didn't use a broadband strong motion data. And uh, this is a very special uh, seismometer. And uh, in Japan, we have broadband network uh, called FNET. And uh, we have a tunnel, and uh, we put the broadband seismograph at the end of the tunnel. And then some strong motion seismogram is collocated with the broadband seism seismometer. Now, this is a special uh, seismometer. And usually, we use three different types of the seismometer. The one is a high sensitivity or short period seismometer, and then strong motion seismometer, and also broadband seismometer. 
And then this seismometer is a uh, usually this seismometer is is good for the measuring fast and strong motion. Okay. But uh, this one was special seismometer that can measure fast as well as slow motion in strong motion. Okay. And uh, this is uh, using the velocity type and then so that they cannot measure weak motion but that they can measure the strong motion. And so this is very useful for our wave, uh, for the waveform inversion analysis because this can be used for the slow motion also. <coughs> and so actually I used uh, those strong motion, broadband strong motion data and then I analyzed uh, Tohoku earthquake and I used the, the data from those uh, stations and then waveform inversion is very successful and then finally we I obtained uh, momentum magnitude 9.1 so that's very very correct magnitude estimation so that if they could do that JMA could do that then could have more uh, correct magnitude estimation in a more early stage so in this sense it's very very important to have such uh, high quality data for our our analysis. <coughs> okay, <coughs> and then anyway, this is after the event. This is a minor analysis, but to have quick estimation, automated system is very essential. So that SWIFT is running in an automatic way, and then this is a flowchart how the SWIFT is running in his uh, automatic process and the SWIFT is activated from the earthquake notification email issued by the SISCOMP system and uh, receiving this uh, email then SWIFT reads uh, earthquake origin time and initial source location and uh, this is trigger for the SWIFT process and then then SWIFT look at the seismic data and then pre-processing uh, filter application data quality check and etc and then using Green's function library, pre-calculated uh, Green's function library, then SWIFT performs waveform inversion, estimation of mechanism, search for the source location, rupture direction, or moment function. And then if result is uh, good enough, then it's uploaded to the web. Okay. <coughs> and then we have been operating uh, SIFT in Fi Indonesia and the Philippine regions. And uh, those are maps of the broadband uh, stations in Indonesia and the Philippines. <coughs> and then we have estimated source, source parameters of earthquake in this region uh, with a moment magnitude more than 4.5. <coughs> And then in the Philippines, we had a JIC uh, JST project in the previous five or four or five years, and uh, we have been running the SWIFT system. And then during this uh, project period, we estimate more than 300 CMP solutions. And uh, we had uh, some, uh, you know, portal site for the earthquake uh, source information so that uh, this was useful to share uh, earthquake information not only in the Philippines, but also Japan. <coughs> and then we compared uh, our solutions uh, with the global CMT solutions uh, to check our, the quality of our, our uh, results. And then as you see here, this is a comparison of the estimated moment in the horizontal axis is the global CMT and the vertical axis is a SWIFT. And you see that uh, it's a very good uh, correlation. <coughs> and also, this is a mechanism, SWIFT and the global CMT. And uh, it's, it's uh, very highly consistent. And here, we show the histogram of the number of effects that uh, could be determined by SWIFT, as well as global CMT. And the red is a global CMT. And uh, the, this uh, green one is a SWIFT. And we had uh, more earthquakes that could be estimated by our system, especially for smaller magnitude. 
so that the uh, shift is uh, consistent with the global so CMT solution, as, as well as a shift estimate the CMT of smaller events uh, with the magnitude uh, less than five. And then we can, we use a regional data so that we can have more quick solutions so that uh, in this sense it has an uh, advantage in uh, using the regional data for our earthquake monitoring. But uh, there is a very serious problem in our analysis of the SIFT. And then uh, this is very critical and uh, we, sh we must have some solution for this for our correct estimation or quick estimation of a moment magnitude and the mechanism. And uh, we call this is a known seismic pulse. And uh, this is one day record of uh, uh, one of the stations at the Philippines, in the Philippines. And uh, you see that uh, those are earthquake uh, records. But uh, here you see that the very long anomalous behavior associated with the arrival of, of the seismic waves. And uh, this is not the real signal, but this is we call known seismic pulse. And uh, this has the features of the long period. Okay, this is a, uh, okay, the 10, 10 minutes so that uh, you see that it's very long period and pulse-like. And then cause is not identified. Uh, but uh, this is very common be found in a broadband seismometer record so that uh, we think that this is caused by some uh, feedback system in a broadband uh, seismometer. And then unregularly appear, and uh, this appear with the arrivals of P and OS waves, so that it's very difficult to distinguish if this is real or artifact or noise. <coughs> and then uh, they have larger amplitudes. So this, so that this can very critically affect our automatic solution. Here, this is an example that uh, automatic solution affected by such no seismic pulse. And then those three, this looks like a real signal, but this is a non seismic pulse. And uh, this contamination of such noise, then solution become like this. But when we erase, or if we do not use such pulse, then we have more better uh, correct solution, and that we call manual solution, and that is estimated by this. And then color shows the depth, so that the uh, manual solution is more deeper, but the uh, automatic solution contaminated by such pulse is much shallower, and the mechanism is clearly different. So that this is very serious problem in our use of such solution for tsunami uh, prediction. Because in this case, it's shallower, so that that can have some false uh, estimation of a tsunami height. <coughs> so then we have to we should not use such uh, pulses, but it's not so easy. <coughs> so then we try to do uh, based on uh, our uh, some algorithm, and then we focus on source amplitude. Okay, in a in a band passed waveform at uh, in each station, we define a maximum amplitude of the individual traces. And then using such ma maximum amplitude, uh, we correct for the geometrical splitting and uh, attenuation using this equation. And then we estimate such amplitude, how big at the source. And we call it the source amplitude. Okay. And then we estimated such source amplitude in the individual traces. And we estimate the source amplitude for e each event. And uh, this is uh, results of uh, such uh, source amplitudes uh, plotted against the moment magnitude for the based on the manual solution of the earthquake that occurred in Indonesia and the Philippines. The epicenter is shown in by red circles. And uh, you see that such source amplitude have some uh, feature. Okay, 
this is one event. And because of the radiation pattern, then this source amplitude have scattered. But uh, when we look at different events, this scatter exists in a particular band independent of mo moment magnitude. And uh, this is some uh, feature that we obtained from the based on the manual solutions. And then if we compare uh, those source amplitudes from incorrect uh, automatic solution that affected by such non-seismic pulse, then we show such uh, results using red and green. And uh, you will see that such uh, incorrect solution contains some uh, source amplitude ratio, so that uh, this could be used for the discrimination of real signal and noise. And uh, we use this algorithm for apply the, this algorithm to, to our incorrect uh, source uh, um, automatic solutions. And uh, this is showing the automatic solution that affected such noise and uh, the manual one. And uh, we see the large difference in the uh, epicenters because of the such noise effect. But when we used this ratio threshold, then this difference is greatly improved. So that uh, in this way, we have more better solution based on such algorithm using the amplitude duration. And also we compared the mechanism and we see that the, this is auto and this is manual, auto and manual. We see the big difference because of such noise effect. But when we use this algorithm, then we have more uh, 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 improvement between the, this estimated one and the manual one. So that this can be used to improve our automatic solutions, and that is essential for our uh, tsunami uh, monitoring and tsunami uh, prediction. <coughs> OK, so that uh, quick and correct magnitude mechanism estimates, what we needed is uh, real-time data without delays, and uh, continuous data without gaps, and uh, no large noise in 50 to 200 seconds in a long period band and the uh, data quality control and maintenance of stations, and the improvement of quality of automatic solution that is the, the most essential for our uh, direction. <coughs> and then operator to check an automatic solution and to perform a manual review quickly. And then, okay, and also important, the issue is that the systematic use of seismic data from global networks for the high percent and magnitude determination in size compete. This is also important. Okay, <coughs> then I will show our progress in Ecuador. So we uh, uh, have been, we installed the SIFT and we temporarily used the computer in, uh, in IG. And then uh, we have estimated source mechanism. And this is one of the, the solution that uh, is estimated by SWIFT. <coughs> and then, um, uh, we had a meeting uh, the last March in Colombia, in uh, SGC, uh, about uh, data sharing. So uh, this is uh, one, uh, some uh, broadband stations in uh, Ecuador. And uh, now we have uh, the IG uh, re receiving data uh, from SGC, so that uh, such uh, data sharing is uh, essential to have a uh, better s mechanism solution in a uh, border region uh, between Ecuador and Colombia. So that th this is a very important step to have a uh, more better solutions. And then now we have uh, new computers. And then the, the this week we uh, performed the installation of a SIS system and that was successful. <coughs> okay, then future works. Uh, okay, continuous uh, SWIFT operation. And uh, then we have, still we have only broadband, normal broadband seismometers. And then in this project, uh, we are purchasing uh, uh, broadband strong motion seismometers. And uh, that has to be deployed. <coughs> and also the additional normal broadband seismometers are uh, uh, useful to have a more high density uh, network that is useful for our 
uh, analysis in SWIFT. And then we should have some mechanism for a more efficient earthquake information sharing with the uh, INOCAL and the SGR. <coughs> And also, we need to develop a tsunami warning system based on uh, earthquake information. So this is uh, our future work in view of the IG side. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>
normal broadband rec uh, sensor and uh, broadband strong motion seismometer. They collocated, and we use both data. Yeah. Okay. Could, could you explain why we don't use uh, uh, strong motion accelerometers okay. instead of the strong motion velocimeters? Okay. This is very clear. Okay, accelerometer is is uh, designed to to estimate the fast and strong motion records. That is is more focusing on this part, and then so that of course you can use slower part in this seismometer record, but it's very, very noisy mm. of, uh, because of the sensor characteristics. And then, as you know, that uh, we use a broad, normal broadband seismometer is a velocity type. Mm. And a normal short period sensor is also velocity type. And a velocity type sensor is essential to have a uh, low noise in a uh, slow motion. And then this uh, sensor is, is designed in this way. So it's a kind of a broadband seismometer, you know, you know, adopted in a large amplitude, strong amplitude. Hmm. So if the roof cake is very, very, very big, then you may able to uh, use oops, this sensor in a slow motion. But normally, it's not so uh, useful. Correlation with the, with the uh, movement of the, of the fault, uh, mm -hmm. it is uh, something that you can use to uh, uh, more, mm -hmm. more quickly of, uh, Look at or, or estimate uh, what could be the, uh, the, the potential tsunami with that. Mm, okay. So, okay, what we do now is to use this anyway, use this point source mechanism. Then we assume there's some scaling <coughs> of the size, and then using this mechanism, we can uh, assign the fault. And then we estimate uh, some uh, slip. Yeah. And then we estimate the deformation at the ocean bottom. And that is used to estimate the tsunami height. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is uh, the most simplest, simple way to have a uh, tsunami prediction based on a point source. Yeah. So this is what we can do now. But in the future, uh, I want to estimate the the size of the fault, because we are now assuming point source, mm. but the real fault should have a finite dimension. And that such information is very useful to the tsunami simulation. But uh, to do so now, the people are doing the teleseismic waveform inversion to estimate the city uh, distribution. But uh, this is not the uh, case for our tsunami warning because it takes time and it's not the automatic processing is very di difficult for such analysis. So that uh, I want to do have more simple way and to estimate the rough dimension of the finite source. But that is uh, still our future work. Any other questions? What? Question about the equations? <laughs> <laughs>